Good morning, Emmanuel. I want to welcome you. Glad you're here to worship. And uh, man, I'm excited about today's message. First, I just want to encourage you guys to continue to be praying for uh, those in eastern Kentucky that have lost so much. Uh, We sent another mission team this past Wednesday, another team Friday, and then yet another team yesterday on Saturday to continue to minister. And there is much need in the area. Uh, Throughout the last few weeks, uh, there have been dozens of people come to faith through uh, Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief. And, you know, it's in these moments of crisis that God kind of gets our attention. Oftentimes, we just kind of sail through life, and, 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 and we don't really take time to, to really consider why we're here. What is this life all about? And so during this time, as C.S. Lewis says, that God shouts to us in our pain. When there's some pain in our life, we're more attentive to our existence and why we're here. So let's continue to pray uh, for all the devastation. People have lost so much traumatized. Let's continue to go. Let's continue to provide relief. But let's also continue to pray that through this tragedy that God would be glorified and many people would come to faith. Tonight is Grace Marriage. I want to encourage you to be a part of that at all of our campuses. Uh, Williamsburg met yesterday. Richmond and Corbin meet tonight on each of our campuses. And we believe at Emmanuel that marriages, they are the bedrock of civilization because that's the way God designed it. That our hope at Emmanuel is that individuals, when they're looking for a church, they're going to say, I want to go to Emmanuel because I know if I go to Emmanuel, my marriage is going to get better. If my marriage gets better, my life gets better, my kids get better, everything about my life gets better. And, and we are going to focus on marriages, help grow them to be Christ-like. And by the way, also, uh, we pray we're that church. For those of you that aren't married, I can go there and meet a godly spouse. Amen, <laughs> right? And uh, one, one other little plug. Starting September the 11th, we're starting a new sermon series. And between September the 11th and October 23rd, seven weeks, we're going to launch new life groups. And some of you need to consider being a life group leader just for seven weeks. It's just you and gather a few friends together and study God's Word. It's in the context of these small group Bible studies, these life groups, that you will meet lifelong friends. It's in the context of these groups that you're going to meet 2 a.m. friends when stuff goes down. Those are the people that you call. And so what we're doing now is we're ramping up to September the 11th, the launch of the new uh, value series. Some of you need to sign up. You can sign up to the Next Step Station. Uh, You can sign up on our app. But consider being a life group leader for these seven weeks. And maybe some of you just open up your home. You open up your home and you're going to host it. And some of you, you, you might go to the first service at Corbin or uh, the service in Williamsburg. And, and, and you might have it on Sunday morning or Sunday evening. Uh, you might have it in your home. You might have it on campus. But, but take a risk. Do something for Christ and allow God to use that time to change your life. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 24. So we've been in this series, The Household of Faith, Household of God, House Rules. Paul is writing to this young pastor, Timothy. He is at the biggest church in the world at the time. (laughs) Granted, there wasn't a lot of churches in the world at this time. But Paul started the church at Ephesus. And he put Timothy, a young guy in his mid-30s. And the church is causing him problems. Some folks have snuck into leadership positions and they're, they're spreading some false teaching. They're telling Timothy, you're too young to lead this church. And so Paul is giving his young protege some instructions. This is what the household should look like. And one of the things he's been talking about is how to select leaders, deacons, leaders in the church, in particular elders, and that's what we're going to look at today. Last week we looked at Elders pay and elders praise. Uh, We looked at how do you discipline an elder when they fall into sin. And so we're going to pick up our reading in verse, actually 23. 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, verse 23. If you're there, say, let's go. All right. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Number one in your outline, write this down. You find our outline on our app. Or you can just write it in the margins of your Bible. Paul urges Timothy to take care of himself physically. 
Paul gives a parenthetical thought here in the midst of describing how you select elders. He's writing like a personal letter, like an email. It's a, it's a friendly letter. And as he's writing, all of a sudden, some other thoughts come to his mind, so he just scribbles those in. Take some wine for your stomach's sake, for your frequent illnesses that you have. Now, now it could be that the verse right before this, he says, guard your purity. Guard your purity. And he's not wanting Timothy to go to these extremes He's not wanting him to go so far in one direction. He's kind of a a prude and what is known as asceticism. You know, you you kind of, in order to be more holy, you have to deny yourself. You don't eat food for 40 days. Or Man, they did some crazy things. One guy, he, he built this structure some 30 feet in the air, and he stayed up there for literally months to become more holy. And, and he would lower his waist in a bucket to his followers to dispose of. I wouldn't be following that guy. I mean, I was like, I'm out of here, buddy. But he thought it was making him more holy. And Paul's saying, listen, don't, don't go so far to the right. Guard your purity above all. But, Timothy, you've got some stomach issues. Uh, a number of years ago, there used to be alcohol in NyQuil. But it was abused, so they, they took the alcohol out of NyQuil and they substituted it with something else. And it's as if Paul is telling Timothy, bro, it's okay, take NyQuil. I understand it has some alcohol in it, but it's going to help you. It's going to help your stomach situation. Now, it was commonly believed at the time uh, that alcohol had medicinal benefits, that, that it helped you. But also, just practically speaking, their water was bad. I mean, uh, you know, we have places in our area called Stinking Creek. I mean, this was, this was bad water, okay? It was like a third world country today. Like, you go to Mexico, you don't drink the water. If you do, it's, you know, Montezuma's resen- you know, revenge, you know? It's like, uh, yeah, it's just not good. You don't drink it. Even the locals don't drink it. You go to Haiti, uh, places around the world, they do not have the water system that we have. There's over a million people in Michigan that are on a boil water advisory today. If they drank that water, man, they'd be sick for days. Vomiting and other things going along with it could lead to other complications. In eastern Kentucky right now, there's still hundreds and hundreds of people without water on a boil water advisory. So Paul's telling Timothy, man, the, the water, drink the, it's not safe unless you've got a natural spring there's like amoebas in there, and they're going to go in your stomach. It's going to cause you all kinds of problems. So he says, drink a little bit of wine, and you, you won't have so many stomach issues. You won't have so many problems going on. Now, he does give a, some balance to this issue of alcohol in the letter to Ephesians. So, so Paul wrote Timothy a letter as a pastor, some instructions, but then he wrote the church a letter. It's a letter to the Ephesians. And in chapter 6, or chapter 5, verse 18, he wrote this. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So, at least someone think that 1 Timothy chapter 5 is a license to go and just drink whatever you want to. We have further explanation in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, don't get drunk on wine. Because it leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So there's some things about alcohol that are real clear in Scripture. One, that believers are not to get drunk. The Bible says that someone who gets drunk will not inherit the kingdom of God. That a drunkard will not enter the kingdom of God. It's that serious. It's that serious. Also, we know that if you're underage, the Bible tells us that we should follow the laws of the land. So if you're underage, we also know it's a sin against God to drink alcohol, even in small, modest consumption. So what does it mean to get drunk? What does it mean for you to get drunk? Well, some of it might depend upon uh, the size, uh, what you're drinking. But what if it's your blood alcohol level? So if the Bible says don't, don't get drunk, and what... How many beers is that? Is that one beer? And if, if you were to take a test, your blood alcohol level, the police would say you're drunk, right? You, you might say, well, listen, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going out anywhere. I'm, uh, you know, I can, talk, I can drive. I've only had one or two. 
You know, I can still carry a conversation. And so what you think is drunk versus what a police officer who takes, makes you take a breathalyzer thinks you're drunk could be something totally different. The Bible also tells us not to use our liberty in such a way it could cause our brother to stumble. Let me ask you, if you walked into Applebee's on a Saturday night and your pastor and his wife were ponied up to the bar and throwing back some brewskis or uh, drinking a Long Island iced tea, what would you think? What would you think of I me? Mean, some of you are like, hey, listen, we want to go out with those guys, right? No, but, but it, where would I stand on the non-believer that walks in? And man, if he does that in broad daylight, what does he do under the cover of darkness in his own home? Hey, how, how could I minister to someone who's a recovering alcoholic, someone who struggles well, the Bible says, don't use your liberty, but consider others that might cause them to stumble. I've had many conversations with some of you and some of you watching online about this very issue. One of our owners shared with me how he was convicted over this because someone walked in who he knew struggled with alcoholism. And he just stopped. He said, I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to abuse my liberty because I love my brother that much. I love my sister that much. And many of you know, know I, I grew up in a home. My mom was a bartender. My mom was an alcoholic. Two of my brothers were alcoholics. A sister that was alcoholic. I was around him my whole life. I, I, I know what alcoholism looks like. I lost a dear friend in high school uh, who drove home drunk and flipped a car three times as he went over an exit ramp and he lost his life. Many of you know marriages that have been destroyed. Many of you know of physical abuse uh, that alcohol promoted. And, you know, I'm just not willing to sacrifice the future of my kids for my liberty. If my kids see me taking a, a, one drink of alcohol, I don't know that one drink might send them down a road of destruction. And that, that, that some of us have such addictive qualities in our lives, and it might be your child, it might be your grandchild, and they see mom or dad or Uncle John or whoever it might be drinking a beer, and they think, what well, must be okay? And one drink le leads to another, and then ultimately to a lifestyle. So, we have to be honest about those. And let's be real. First Timothy chapter 5 is talking about his physical health. All right, number two. Paul relieves Timothy of the burden of choosing leaders. He understands Timothy is a little nervous. He has some ulcers. You know, sometimes pastors get ulcers, worried about their people. You've not given me any, okay? I get them on my own, all right, you know? And he says, you know, take a little alcohol for your stomach's sake. And by the way, it, the load's not only on you. Understand the context. He's chosen some leaders, and they're causing trouble. And Timothy, no doubt, is dallying his leadership ability. Is he really up to the challenge? Maybe he's starting to believe the stones that they're casting. Is he old enough? Is he smart enough? Is he spiritual enough? Notice what it says in verse 24. The sins of some are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. He's telling Timothy, listen, when you're choosing leaders in the church calling somebody on staff, calling somebody to be a deacon or an elder. Some sins are obvious. Everybody knows that they're a greedy person. They're given the gossip. They're a bitter person. They're just not nice. So those are just obvious. You know that you shouldn't put in a leadership position in the church. Everybody knows it. But then he says, but then there's some. You just can't tell, Timothy. You can't tell at first. And you're, you're going to put them in a position, and then he says their sins come after them. They eventually show their true colors. And he says, listen, you can't worry about that. In other words, here's the point. Churches will make mistakes. They'll appoint somebody as a life group leader, as a pastor, as a deacon, as a staff member. And then all of a sudden, there's a hidden sin in their life that is exposed and it comes out in ugly ways in the church. And at that point, the church has to deal with that. And we talked about that some last week. 
that when a pastor sins, they should be brought before the entire church and rebuked of their sin so that others will have fear and live a godly life. But Paul says, Timothy, it's not your fault, bro. You didn't know they were like that. You didn't know that they had right belief. So, Timothy goes slowly when choosing elders. He said two verses before this, right before the issue of purity. Don't lay hands too quickly on somebody. Don't appoint them. Don't bless them too quickly. Don't say, bless them. They're the pastor. They're the life group leader. They're the team leader. Too quickly, because sometimes things show up later. And then in verse 25, he says, in the same way, good deeds are obvious. And even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. Just like your sin will find you out, your good deeds will show. When someone in the church is appointed as a deacon or an elder or some type of leadership position, or they're They join staff. They become a minister on staff with us. It should be no surprise. It should be, oh, yeah, that's so obvious. They're so kind and forgiving. They love Jesus. It just radiates from them. They love God's word. They're passionate about studying God's word. Paul tells Timothy, the good deeds follow. It's obvious. He says it twice in one verse. It's going to be obvious, Timothy. It's not going to be a surprise to anyone. So don't think all the pressure is on you. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to put people in leadership positions that didn't deserve it or is unwarranted. Or they might not even be a believer. And he gives evidence of what to do in those situations. Number three, Paul instructs Timothy on the issue of slavery. Chapter 6, verse 1. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. Edward Everett, he was a former dean of Harvard University. The most prestigious university in the world. He was a known orator of the day. And he showed up that day and gave a two hour plus speech. I know what you're thinking. Sounds like our church. (laughs) He comes and he speaks. And listen, in, in their day, they didn't have iPods and YouTube and Hulu and all these devices to spend their time. So oftentimes an event would happen and they would literally pay an orator to come in and kind of entertain the crowd, dazzle them with their storytelling and the eloquent waxing and and vocabulary and all these various things. Well, Dr. Everett was one of these professional orators and he did not disappoint that day. As somebody told my wife one time that I said, you know, your husband's a long-winded preacher. She said, no, he's not. He might be long, but he's never winded. All right, you know. And so here he was. Dr. Everett was up there. You'll get it later. It's okay. And uh, he was up there, and he was was just going at it, and people were amazed. And then, small, slender, yet tall, lanky man rose to the platform, spoke for less than three minutes, And he gave one of the most memorable speeches in the history of the world. In fact, some of you have memorized it. That man was Abraham Lincoln, and it was the Gettysburg Address. As he rise to that platform after Dr. Everett came up, he was not the spokesman. He didn't have the pedigree. But he rose and gave that famous speech. Born in... Kentucky, held from Illinois. It is said by historians that he wrote the speech on the train to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And these words ring true even today. All men are created equal. But Abraham Lincoln didn't come up with that. He was a man of deep faith. He was a Christian. 
He was a Christ follower. See, it come, goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Let us create man in our own image. and the image of God, he created man and woman. We are all created in the image of God. And we have dignity because we bear the image of God. That no matter your background, your ethnicity, your nationality, your social economic status, your education level or lack thereof, we all have equal value to God and therefore to one another. We are made in the image of God. We are image bearers of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so when we see someone, we don't just see them for who they are. We see them through the lens that they are created by God for God. And when he created them, he says, it is very good. So as a born-again believer, when we interact with a life group leader who's dressed just the part, who says just the right words, we interact with them with dignity and respect. <laughs> and when we come across a guy that just left a music festival and he's all tatted up and inked up and, you know, hasn't washed his hair for five days, he's trying to grow some dreads, and, and we interact with him, we interact with him with the same respect and dignity as that life group leader. To that imam who doesn't believe what we believe, who we understand through the scriptures, if he doesn't turn to Christ, he's going to die and he's going to spend eternity in hell. And they oppose us and, 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 and they confront us, but we treat them with the same dignity and respect as we do that life group leader. Why? Because they are made in the image of God. It doesn't matter their party affiliation. It doesn't matter their religious background. That as a Christian, we treat all people the same because we are all created in the image of God. God doesn't judge us based upon our past, but he judges us based upon what we do with the finished work of Christ. Have we been born again? Have we been saved? Have we turned to Christ? And yet, the serious student must deal critically with these verses. Is Paul condoning slavery? In this moment, this leadership letter, why does he not go straight to the issue? I mean, this, this would be an affront to the gospel. It is incredibly important when you read Scripture that you translate it in the context in which it was written. If you read this in the context of the African slave trade, then you would want to rip these pages right out of the book. And you would want to schedule a meeting with a pastor or a spiritual mentor and ask, how in the world can this be in Scripture? How in the world does Paul not come against slavery? Well, let me, let me give at least four different forms of slavery that we've seen throughout history. And there are, there are more. The first is a Hebrew servant. Now, in the Old Testament, and even into the New, there was an allowance for slaves. But it wasn't like you and I. It's not the PBS special roots or uh, purple. or it, It's not the horrendous things that we should be ashamed of as a country. That is not the worldview in which you need to interpret this text. Hebrew slaves in the Old Testament, was a welfare program. God's desire is that none of God's people would be in poverty. The Bible says, I've never seen God's people beg for bread. Why? Because God made an allowance, a welfare system within the people of God. Everybody had a piece of land. That's why there's so much fighting in the Middle East. Every person has a plot of ground. Every Jew has a home in the land that was given to them by God. It was allotted to them and it was divided up. And so, for example, we live in a fallen world. God knew that his people were going to make some bad decisions, some bad financial decisions. Maybe they'd become an alcoholic, various things. They'd lose everything they had. But he loved his people so much, he didn't want them to just be destitute. 
So what I could do, if that was me, if I'm the one that made those decisions, I could come to you and I could say, I will be your slave if you'll provide for me and my family. And you, as a good Jew, would say, yes, I'll allow you to come in. But you have to give me your your rights for that property as an earnest, as a deposit, as a pledge. And I can make money on it during a certain length of time. And after that certain length of time, after I served you for that length of time, you had to give me my property back. It was like starting over. And so every seven years and every 50 years, it was called the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee, everything was given back to you. All your debts were forgiven. And so I would indenture myself to you so my family wouldn't starve to death. But after six years, in the seventh year, I would... I would get off welfare, you would give me my land back, and I would go make a living. That's something we can learn, like welfare shouldn't last forever, there should be an end date. That's a good biblical model. And the Old Testament, it it gives, not only do you have to give the land back to them, it's not forever, you've got to help them out, you've got to make sure they don't starve to death, but you give that land back, but also you can't abuse them, you can't mistreat them, and there's this long list of things you can do. Now, if you begin to translate what Paul's talking about in that context, you're helping a brother out. They made some bad decisions. They've fallen into poverty. And so they're going to give you their land as earnest. They're going to come live with you. They're going to eat off your land, and you're going to have them in your household. The second is Roman slavery. That also would have been happening at this time. And it was deeply ingrained in the economy. Historians tell us over half of the Roman Empire were slaves. Slaves owned slaves. It was akin to what's happening in India today, like a caste system. Some slaves were treated really well and much like a Hebrew servant would be. It was helping them out until they could get on their feet. But others, it was grueling and it was humiliating. The important thing to understand about the Roman system, it was not based on ethnicity. It was based on social status. Were you a Roman? And if you were a Roman, you couldn't be a slave. But if you were not a Roman, you could become a slave and eventually work your way into being a citizen. Now, the Romans eventually abolished slavery, but not for good intentions. The Roman emperor that abolished slavery in the Roman Empire, was because of economy. Their economy was failing, and slaves didn't pay taxes. So he freed everybody, freemen, a free man. He freed all the slaves so they can begin to give taxes. The third is indentured servants. Historians tell us one half to two-thirds of of all Anglo-Saxons got to America through indentured servitude. And so if if your ancestors, if, if, if you're a white European ancestry, your ancestors probably got here through slavery, what's called indentured, so over half to two-thirds. And you didn't have the money to get to the Americas. You didn't have the money to pay for your voyage here. You didn't know where you were going to stay. So you would contract with somebody who was already here who was wealthy or somebody in Europe that had lands here, and you would agree to come work the land. You would be an indentured servant. This is much like Hebrew slavery. It was a contractual agreement. And then after a period of time, you were set free. Now, what most of us are familiar with is the African slave trade that happened during the 18th and 19th century. Through Europe, through the Americas, Brazil, for example, uh, there were more slaves taken to Brazil than all other countries combined, and it was cruel conditions. It was sin. It was depravity. That is not what Paul is addressing here. I'm reminded of a story of Frederick Douglass as he talks about his aunt that came over on the slave ship and how that cruel captain at his bidding would bring her down, tie her up, and strip her down, and beat her. And he says, no words or no prayers, or no cries could stop him. It was, it was worse than our minds could even imagine, or any producer, film, and theaters. 
and we should be horrified at that. We should speak out against it. As believers, we should also know that slavery is not a part of creation, but it is a product of sin. Paul is not endorsing slavery. He is trying to help those trapped in slavery. We all have equal dignity before God. He would also say in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So again, this Hebrew context, this Roman context, he's saying you need to follow the Scriptures. It is there for their benefit, not just yours. It is not just for your gain, but it is also for their good. And then after a period of time, they're to be set free. He spoke to it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and he speaks against the slave trade that you and I are more accustomed to. In verse 10, he says, actually begin in verse 9. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and the irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, and for slave traders, and for liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So in the same letter to Pastor Timothy, he condemns slave trading. But then when we get to chapter 6, he speaks to the person that is in slavery. And he tells them, all who are under a yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So if you have indentured yourself to someone for whatever reason, he says you should work hard. You should be kind to the person that has your debt, that owns your debt, because in doing so, you might gain a, gain a hearing for the gospel. Otherwise, they might speak bad of the church. Verse 2, those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are to be devoted to the welfare of their slaves. In other words, but if your boss or your master is a believer, you should serve them well. You shouldn't show up late and leave early. You should give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. These were paid individuals. And so he is speaking to them in their situation. They're trapped in the situation. So how should you behave? You should behave in a way that honors the Lord, that ultimately will glorify God. I think many of us who live in pristine homes, have white picket fences, don't realize that there are 40 million people in slavery today. There are more people in slavery today than the history of the world. In Indonesia, in China, North Korea, India, the Sudan, Iran, and in the United States of America. Every year at the Super Bowl, there are children that are given to perverted men to do whatever they want at their bidding. The police scour the area. Christian ministries show up at the Super Bowl to try to rescue individuals that are literally sex slaves. Of the 40 million plus that are in slavery today, 70% of them are women. Over 40% of them are children. In Nepal, Kathmandu, children are abducted, taking literally miles away from everything they are known, and placed in brothels where they'll never see the light of sun again. They don't know if they'll get bread before their next customer. Moms and dads in absolute poverty, 
are tricked and manipulated and believing that their young girls and their young boys are going to be taken to the city to be educated by a sharp tongue devil, only to be tricked and the money never shows up and the child never returns. And yet, we're worried because our 401k has declined 10%. We are worried because maybe our kids aren't getting into the right college or they're not going to the right branch of military when literally there are children that we don't know if they'll make it tomorrow because of the sexual abuse. In slavery today, chained to beds, deprived of, of food, deprived of family, and we sit in the comfort of our sanctuaries and the only thing we're concerned about is what's for lunch. May God forgive us. May God have mercy on us. And may, may God awaken us out of our slumber. We've given ourselves to materialism and worldliness. When we have the message of hope, the power of the gospel my Jesus says in Luke 4, I've come to set prisoners free. I come to declare to the captive freedom, sight to the blind. When even as believers, we wander around in the dark, concerned about clothes that maybe aren't the latest brand, or should we... Kids have iPhones. What will you do? What's your next step? Many read these verses. And they ask, why did Paul not speak to social reform? Why, why did he not go straight to the heart of the problem? Because the problem isn't the social structure. The problem is the wicked heart of men and women that need to be set free by the power of the gospel. As believers, our goal is not to make America great again. This is not our home. We are sojourners just passing through. We serve a king of another world. He will bring a new world. There's a new kingdom coming. There's a new Jerusalem. There's a new world. And it will not be a democratic process. You won't run for Congress. It is a monarchy. There is one king, and it is King Jesus. And he gives his edicts, and we follow the lordship of Christ. Your goal and your mission is not to make this world better. No. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. Yes, I understand. As a born-again believer, your generosity and your kindness and your forgiveness and your work ethic will make the world around you better. But that is not your goal nor mission. No, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to go into all the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and set the prisoner free, free from sin. Ultimately, Christ came not to set the slave free in this world, but to set all of us free from the bondage of sin and slavery, that we might walk in the freedom of Christ. That is the gospel message, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the gospel. But God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son into the world to die on a cross for your sin for the sin that you've committed this week, this hour. He was nailed to a cross and took your punishment, took my punishment. That our sin might be dealt with, it might be forgiven for all times. And the Bible says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord? Is there a difference in your life? You know, Jesus also did not come to change social order. Everybody was asking him, oh, Jesus, when are you going to overthrow the Romans? 
When will you put Israel back in its place at the top of the food chain? He would have nothing of it. No. He wasn't here to change the social order. He was here to change hearts that ultimately will change the social order. Zacchaeus was a cheat, was a scoundrel, and who knows whatever else. But when he met Jesus, his life was forever changed. And he went as a changed man. You remember what he told Jesus at his party? He threw a party and Jesus was there. Everyone was there. And he says, I'm going to give everything back. Everybody I've cheated, I'm going to give it back. And I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. That was a changed man. Have you been changed by the power of the gospel? Is it evidence in your life of lordship? That you forsake, this world has nothing for me. Nothing. It's not about education. It's not about achievement. It's not about a bank account. It's not about a picket fence and two and a half kids and a dog named Rover. No. It's about King Jesus and proclaiming the glorious gospel that saved a sinner like me. What are you running after? And how far have you gotten? Has it brought satisfaction? How much is enough? Just a little bit more. You'll never get there. Only in Christ will you be satisfied. Turn to Him today. Get moving to Just do something. Just do something for the glory of God and the good of all people. Stand to your feet as I pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and we adore you. God, we are so thankful that you have set us free from worldliness, materialism, from all that binds us to this world. God, this is not our home. God, help us to live like it. Ignite in us a passion for the lost and the hurting. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.